I have actually been to every inhabited continent on this planet, Africa, Asia, America, Oceania, and Europe. Wait, Europe. Is that even a separate continent? That's where the confusion about the term continent starts. The term comes from the Latin, terra continens, and means something like, continuous land, okay, that doesn't really help us yet. So mostly large, contiguous sections of land on our planet are called continents and Europe, for example, is usually considered its own continent, but more for historical and cultural reasons. Geographically, one must actually say that Europe belongs to the continent of Eurasia. The same is true for North and South America. Many people see North America and South America as separate continents, but there is more to be said for counting America as a whole as a continent. You get a better understanding of the term continent if you dig a little deeper and look beneath the surface of the Earth. The solid crust of the Earth is dominated by two types of plates, the so-called continental plates, which consist of silicate-rich and granitic rocks, and the oceanic plates, which are much thinner and consist of heavier basaltic rocks. Most researchers think that the continents were formed from the ocean crust. That is, the ocean crust is the primordial crust of our planet, so to speak. Nice word, your cruster, sounds like a German bread. Researchers believe that this was formed in so-called subduction zones, where the primordial crust, the ocean crust, was pushed down towards the Earth's mantle. Subduction zones are areas where plates hang down towards the Earth's mantle, or bend, so to speak. Such downward hanging plates are also called slabs. And if such a slab then hangs downwards, another plate can drive over the slab. These tectonic processes probably created the continents. Besides this slab theory, however, there is another idea of how continents could have been formed in the middle of the oceanic crust, i.e. not in such subduction zones, in the middle of the crust, new continents could also be formed, namely through so-called oceanic plateaus. These are areas in which large magma deposits can be pressed up through the crust from below and thus form new continents. Until now, however, this has only been a theory. But now it seems to be more than just a theory, because in the southern Indian Ocean, in the Antarctic waters of the so-called Kerguelen Archipelago, a new continent is thought to have been discovered in the making. This is actually a very remote place on our planet, the Kerguelen belonged to France but nobody lives there except a few researchers and a few penguins, but besides that there is now just a new continent embryo. Because near the Kerguelen archipelago, researchers have now discovered a collection of granitic rock called cyanite in the middle of the oceanic crust. As I just told you, granitic rock is a feature of the continental crust rather than the oceanic crust. That is, this is an amazing discovery, to discover so much continental rock in the oceanic crust. So this magma plateau of cyanite, probably entered the oceanic crust from below, and when magma penetrates the crust from below, this is also called a lacolith in geology. This supports exactly the theory I have just presented to you, that continents can also form in the oceanic plates through magma plateaus. The research team gave this magma lacolith the easy to pronounce name, South Ralea du Beatty Intrusive Complex, SRBIC for short, and sees great similarities to a continental crust. The leader of the research team, Leandre Ponthus, says the following. Our results establish strong similarities between the SRBIC, the only known example so far of a felsic lacolith in an oceanic plate, and many continental plutons. The SRBIC has the characteristics of a continental plutonic complex embedded in oceanic crust. Geologists tend to express themselves in very complicated terms. A pluton, for example, is a major influence of deep rock into the Earth's crust. So what Ponthus is really saying in simple terms is that around the Kerguelen Archipelago in the Indian Ocean, there is a continent embryo in the oceanic crust, just waiting to be pushed even further up through the crust. But it will be some time before we can pack our bags and visit the new continent. In geology, everything always takes a long time. That means, maybe a few million years and then the continent will have completely pushed up to the surface and we can visit it. So be patient a little longer, people. There is plenty of ice not only around the South Pole, but also in the Northern Hemisphere. And here, too, new things are being discovered all the time. Recently, NASA found something truly incredible under Greenland. This story of an apocalyptic impact and its consequences is not to be missed. Greenland is an absolutely fascinating place. It is the largest island in the world and almost 80% of its surface is covered with ice and glacier.
you can see how huge Greenland is by the fact that even the small ice-free part of the island is still the size of the whole of Sweden. Politically, Greenland is an independent part of Denmark, but geographically it is in North America. According to researchers, the Greenlandic ice is between 400,000 and 800,000 years old, which is very old by our standards, but from a geological point of view it is only a brief moment. This begs the question, what was actually before the ice? And more importantly, what is under the ice? Here is a topographic map of the land area under the ice sheet. In the far northwest of Greenland is the Hiawatha Glacier. In 2015, not so long ago, researchers made an incredible discovery. Beneath the glacier is a crater of epic proportions. It was discovered during NASA's Ice Bridge mission, which used airborne radar to measure the thickness of the ice sheet. The Hiawatha crater stretches over 31 kilometers and lies up to 1 kilometer below the Greenland ice sheet. Something like this can only be caused by an extremely violent impact. By comparison, the Chicxulub crater, which is thought to be caused by the meteorite that started the mass extinction of the dinosaurs, has a diameter of 180 kilometers. So the Hiawatha crater is much smaller, but it is still on the scale of a world-changing impact. Scientists were all the more surprised after the discovery of the crater in 2015, because now they had the strange situation of having found a crater first, and only then having to start looking for the worldwide impact of the impact. With the Chicxulub crater it was the other way round. Because the existence of dinosaurs and their mass extinction had been known for a long time, but the crater was missing. And that's why, after the discovery of the Hiawatha crater, the wildest hypotheses sprouted from the ground. Especially popular, the impact was responsible for an ominous cold period that began 13,000 years ago. By examining fossil tree trunks, researchers had discovered that 13,000 years ago there was an extreme change in the climate in Europe that fundamentally altered flora and fauna. This cold spell was named after an arctic plant and is called the driest cold period. So somehow everything fell into place and everyone was happy. The explanation for the driest cold period was found with the Hiawatha crater, peace, joy, pancakes. Well, it's not quite that simple, because now the researchers have taken a closer look at some mineral crystals from the crater. Here we see the photo of the research team at the edge of the Hiawatha Glacier, somehow a dream job, I think. The examined crystals were washed from the crater area to the edge of the glacier by meltwater, and the result of the analyses has so overturned the hypotheses. How old is the Hiawatha crater really? A geochemical analysis of the crystals washed out, and a measurement of the radioactive decay of their isotopes led to a relatively clear result. The crater is not 13,000 years old. It is 58 million years old. So they had slightly overestimated. Somehow unfair, if I misjudged by an order of magnitude of millions in maths lessons back then, I always failed the test. You may be wondering how the age can be determined so accurately. Some of the crystals studied, zircon crystals to be exact, showed linear fracture patterns that serve as evidence that they date from the time of the impact. And the zircon contains traces of radioactive uranium, whose decay to lead makes it possible to date the samples precisely. So the impact of the Hiawatha meteor happened at a time when humans were not even close to appearing on the evolutionary scene. It was much warmer then, and Greenland was dotted with dense forests, not a trace of today's ice desert. Presumably, many prehistoric creatures lived there at that time, and their day was spoiled by the impact. The meteorite did not hit a thick layer of ice, but smashed directly into the ground, which must have been equivalent to the force of several million Hiroshima atomic bombs. Ouch! The newly dated age for the crater is of course also quite a setback for the proponents of the Dryas hypothesis. Marine biologist James Kennett of the University of California, who was one of the leading proponents of the theory, admits defeat, saying, the older date for the crater is a surprise. But the new research makes a very compelling case. I don't think it's related to the driest cold period now. I think that's a great example of how science should work, you research different hypotheses, but don't cling to them doggedly, but are always ready to be changed by new facts. And perhaps even rejoice in new findings. Besides, how could it be otherwise, new hypotheses are now sprouting from the ground.
If the impact occurred 58 million years ago, could it be responsible for some other world-changing geological event? Some researchers involved in the New Age determination are skeptical, saying that while the one and a half to two kilometer meteorite that caused Hiawatha was regionally devastating, there is no evidence that a dust cloud and the fires that may have followed the impact disrupted the global climate 58 million years ago. But there are also other opinions. Sidney Hemming, a geochemist at Columbia University, has an interesting idea. The so-called Paleocene-Eocene temperature maximum occurred 55.8 million years ago. Good word for Scrabble. The Paleocene-Eocene temperature maximum refers to a global temperature rise that lasted about 100,000 to 200,000 years, relatively short in geological terms. The average global temperature rose by 6 to 8 degrees Celsius, so 58 million years ago the Hiawatha meteorite struck, 55.8 million years ago a global temperature rise began. It would be a laugh if the intervening 2.2 million years could not somehow be optimized away in order to come up with a spectacular scientific hypothesis. That's exactly what Sidney Hemming suggests, saying that one might not be so sure about the exact dates, and that the Hiawatha impact could be the reason for the Paleocene-Eocene temperature maximum. But as things stand now, you just have to say that it remains an absolute mystery whether the Hiawatha impact had an impact on the environment, and if so, what that impact was. So the whole thing is a kind of geological criminal case and it remains exciting. I hope that our journey through the eternal ice has made it clear to you how much there is still to discover on our own planet and how similar, for example, Antarctica and the icy moons of the gas giants are. If you like my videos, I would be galactically pleased if you would follow the channel because I know from the YouTube statistics that most viewers have not yet subscribed. But it's completely free, it helps me a lot and you won't miss any more galactic videos. So everybody, press the subscribe button, it's not just Antarctica that has objects from outer space. Just a few years ago, an interstellar object, i.e. from another star system, crashed in the Pacific Ocean. And now the unbelievable, a team of scientists has found it. And a Harvard professor involved claims that this is alien technology. So did a UFO really crash in the Pacific? Everything about this crazy story and original footage of the find can be found in the video below. Be sure to check it out and if you want to support my work, get some real meteorites in my space shop. Every purchase helps me a lot to continue the channel. Otherwise, I'd say see you in the next video. Take care guys.